Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. <clears throat> Hope you all had a good week. If you all remember last week where we left off, we saw the gathering of Israel in the wilderness. God has collected his people. The devil's angry with the nation of Israel has ever since they were God's chosen people because it was prophesied that through the lineage of Israel that one would come that would destroy the devil so last week we saw that the dragon as the devil is called in chapter number 13 or chapter number 12 pursued her could not find her and won't find her because God made a place for her to have provisions well chapter number 13 we find out about some of the devil's associates during the Great tribulation period. <clears throat> Chapter number 13, verse number 1, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him power and his seat and great authority and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worshipped the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if any man have an ear let him hear we'll stop there I doubt we'll get through all of that this morning. But in the beginning of chapter number 13, we've already addressed the dragon, Satan. In times past, he was known as Lucifer. We already read in the book of Revelation where he's the king of the bottomless pit. That's what we call hell. His names were Abaddon and Apollyon. But he's got many names. But in chapter number 13, we find one of his servants. Not just one of his servants, possibly the chief servant of the devil. This, in chapter number 13, when it refers to the beast, is referring to the Antichrist. And in verse number 5, it says that he was given power to continue 40 and 2 months. You look it up, that's three and a half years. You're going to keep finding that number over and over throughout the book of Revelation because there are two halves of the Great Tribulation. Seven years divided into three and a half halves. And the first three and a half we know will be a time where they boast great peace, where they boast unity, where the ideal of the secular world of all coming together under one banner with one unified goal finally does happen. There will be a one world government. There will be a one world economy. There will be one person in charge and that is the one that we've read about so far in chapter number 13. The Antichrist. The Beast. But we do get a picture of some of his traits in this chapter. First Verse number one, it says, And I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. We see his origin. Now where does the Antichrist come from? He comes from the unknowable depths of the ocean. People trying to figure out who the Antichrist is, you're not going to figure it out. He's coming out of nowhere. You can look all over the world for him. You can look at all of his attributes. You can look at all of his traits. But you're not going to find the Antichrist until he is revealed. The thing that makes him special is that 
the dragon, Satan, gives him power. He's not free to do that right now. God hadn't permitted that to happen. So until that happens, whether he's a person robed in flesh just like you and I that becomes possessed by Satan, or whether he's someone literally out of the bottomless pit, it doesn't matter. He can't do anything right now. He has no more power than you or I on today's date. But stop trying to figure out who the Antichrist is going to be. It doesn't matter. We're going to be gone if you're saved. And it's not going to matter who he is until the Lord allows him to take authority from Satan to rule over the world. But it says he comes out of the deeps, the unknowable places. But it's just a waste of time trying to figure out where he's going to come from, what nationality he's going to be. He's going to be the poster child of inclusivity. Right? He's probably going to identify as something that we haven't even heard yet out of all the trans and everything else on what pronouns they want to use. Okay? He's going to be a tickler of ears. He's going to make great swelling promises. He's going to demonstrate certain amounts of power. And because of his power being unchecked by the Holy Ghost, because when the church goes out, we've already said the Holy Ghost comes out, it's going to look like he doesn't have any enemies. That nobody can stop him. That, for a time of three and a half months, I mean three and a half years, 42 months, it's going to look like he's the one that has all the answers to all the problems of the world and everything just makes sense because when he says it, it sounds really good to man's intellect. It sounds really good to man's desires. It sounds really good. Why? Because he is the embodiment of the spirit of Antichrist. In full fruition, he is the exact opposite of Christ. Now we could go through the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote and that other apostles wrote, and you're going to find mention in reference to the spirit of Antichrist. That's been around since the garden. The spirit of Antichrist started with the one who gives the power to the Antichrist, the devil. You say, when, Brother Jordan, when in eternity past he desired to exalt his throne above the throne of the Lord? Why? Because he was anti-Christ receiving glory and honor and all that was due him. That's where the spirit of Antichrist started. This is its final form. This is... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Unmitigated. Unleashed. Right? No restrictions placed upon it. The exact opposite of Christ. And don't find... You know, too much, we've already said how many times that the devil tries to imitate the things of God. Is it any wonder that during the end times there's the dragon, Satan, that there's the beast, and then later we're going to find out about the prophet? God has three. Who are they? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Satan's got three too. But this Antichrist, it says that his appearance, first he has seven heads and ten horns. That means that God does things that's all decent and in order. Right? We know the 40 and 2 elders, or the 20 and 4 elders. Right? Who's that? That's 12 in the Old Testament, 12 in the New Testament. God, everything is symmetrical. The devil can't even figure out how many horns to put on the Antichrist's head. Why do you say that? Because he's got seven heads and ten horns. That means it's not equal on some of them. But no, those seven heads... Much conjecture, much debate about what the seven heads represent. One interpretation is that each one of those heads represents a different dispensation. And that throughout every dispensation there has been a spirit of Antichrist. Do we not read about how there are many spirits of God? There is the Holy Ghost but then there are different spirits, right, movements that the Holy Ghost, get. there's different offices that he has. He may touch you in different ways using the same spirit. Well, throughout seven dispensations, the devil's adapted. 
his spirit of Antichrist. And then eventually, those seven heads, right, meet their final form, which is what? The beast. And he has ten crowns. Well, if you go study it out, eventually, hopefully, we've got time to do it. But each one of those crowns represents, during the tribulation, the great nations that are left across the world. And it's saying his seven forms of Antichrist have what? Ruled over everything that's left. He's been given power and authority over them. I've heard some say that those seven heads represent one for each continent, each landmass that's on the earth. Right? He has total control. Why? Because the dragon has given him power. He's been given rule and reign. But now he also wears ten crowns upon his ten horns. Meaning what? Not only does he rule the land, he rules the hearts of men. They've made him king over their swaths of the world. What it all boils down to is that his visage is one that is unnatural to us, but the world will accept. In fact, they marvel at the fact that one of these heads was wounded unto death, but then it healed. Have you ever seen somebody who's gone through a near-death experience and then the scar, the result that it had on their visage afterwards, you could just look at whatever they went through, did to them, and know that that probably should have killed them. Well, that's what the world's going to say of the beast. God tried to smite him down, but God couldn't kill him because he healed. It says that they marvel at that visage. In verse number 3 it says, And all the world wondered after the beast. But for a Christian, what that wound represents, did not God tell the serpent in the garden that there was one coming, that he would bruise his heel, but that God's chosen would bruise his head? Well, maybe this is theology according to Brother Jordan. But, if, because he did, but when Christ laid down his life and took it up again, if he gave the concussion of all concussions to the devil, and the Antichrist was standing there next to him, don't you think if he punched the devil hard enough that there was a recoil that also hurt the Antichrist? What's that wound represent that the beast does not have all power? The world will look at it as an example of how, oh, he overcame what God did to him. That's not what that wound represents. The wound represents that God could have killed him, but for a time and for a season and for a reason... He let this thing live. It doesn't say which of the seven heads was wounded. It just says one of them. But how can there be a spirit of Antichrist when God in the flesh is walking around on earth? When those that say he's a heretic that come to arrest him, right? they say, are you him? And he said, I am. They all fell down at the power of him just accepting the fact or admitting the fact that he was the Son of God. I believe that that wound represents that for some 2,000 years now, and who knows how long between now and when these things come to reality, but the world has tried to erase every existence of Christ. They've tried to pervert it. They've tried to manipulate it. They've tried to lie about it. They've tried to find other scientific evidence that only proves the fact that no, what was written in the Bible is true. And in order to conjure up anything else, they either have to leave out very important details or they have to make the requirements so stringent that it doesn't even make sense anymore. For a long time, the Antichrist has had a wound, which is the fact that as long as there are people on this earth that profess the name of Christ, and the evidence of Christ is in their life, you cannot disprove the one that's done that work. 
But when the church is raptured out of here, what happened? That wound heals. It doesn't have to fight against the church anymore. If the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God, how can the spirit of Antichrist prevail against the church whose very existence is only because of the one that they're trying to deny? The wound that the Antichrist has is evidence of the fact that he is not stronger than God, but they put a spin on it. They give it the old CNN and Fox News treatment. And they make you see what they want you to see. They don't want you to think about him getting injured. They want you to think about the fact that he healed. Oh, he almost died. But now he's come back. Stronger than ever. Well, it says that he had a body in verse number 2 like unto a leopard. You know the thing about leopards? There's a bunch of different types of leopards. Anybody ever watch the Jungle Book? Uh, you've got the black panther. That is a subspecies of a leopard. Panthers and leopards very close. There's the snow leopards. Right? Then you get into a bunch of... But they are light-footed. They're stealthy. Leopards, very strong. Not the biggest cat in the world. But they know their strengths... And they usually attack from either somewhere really high or from the shadows. Isn't that the spirit of Antichrist? You can't ever find out who started it, but it's always coming around in the shadow. Well, where'd he come from? Depths of the ocean. They can never find him. Why? Because that body of a leopard, he's a stealthy hunter. Just like the serpent who gave him the power to become the Antichrist. What is he? He's sneaky. He's sly. He's keen. He's cunning. Just like the one that gave him power. But then it says that he has feet like a bear. Now, bears, if you ever look at their feet, they're very wide. Almost like elephants' feet. They, they do resemble each other to a certain extent. But those feet are so strong that if a bear wants to he can just walk up and not punch but put his weight onto a tree and knock it over it supports a lot of weight the feet of bears they have razor sharp claws on them right? they could be used to accomplish something as tools Right, you see bears out in the wild, what they? they take their claws, they scrape the bark off of trees to make it smooth Why? so that they can rub up against it. They can use those claws to cut fruit, berries, things that they eat vegetation-wise. But also, you don't want to be on the receiving end of one of them smacks. Right, they, those feet of the bear, what, they are violent feet. Yes, you can use them to accomplish some things, just like he will, to unify and everything else, but what? Everywhere he goes, there's destruction that follows him. Then it says, in his mouth is the mouth of a lion. Again, Christ being referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The beast will speak as a lion. Meaning what, Brother Jordan? Meaning that he commands respect. Don't care who you are, if you's out in the middle of the African Sahara at night, doesn't matter how big your campfire is, if you heard a lion roar, it'd scare you. Why? Because you know that thing, it's in its element. You are out of your element. If a lion roars, the rest of the animal kingdom, what? Goes quiet. They scatter. I don't want to mess with it. But it's a symbol of the authority and the power that has been given unto him. When he speaks, people will listen. Either they will worship him or they will fear him. But either way, he demands and commands their respect. He demands that all either fall in line with him or as we've already read, they die. 
Either you're with us or you're dead. Mom goes on to say that the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. What's happening here? Well, if you will, the Antichrist is, for lack of a better word, the forerunner to the dragon, to Satan. The prophet is the one that we're going to read about later in this chapter, probably next week. But he talks about how good the beast is. And the beast says, y'all got no idea. Y'all think I'm great. The one that gave me all this power, he's even greater. Sound familiar? Why? He's taking the coming of Christ and literally embodying the opposite of it. Where Christ came seeking to save that which was lost, where Christ came because God so loved the world, the Antichrist comes because Satan hates the world, and instead of seeking to save, he seeks to destroy. He is not gathering all of the world together to unify them toward something good. He's unifying them so that he can destroy it. But if you will, the Antichrist is the emissary, the first one to show up, the landing party for everything that the devil has planned. And how long does his reign last? Three and a half years. For the first three and a half years, the Antichrist will, for lack of a better term, acquire worshipers and groupies. Look in verse number four. They worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? The beast comes and says, The one that gave me all the ability to do what I do, he's right around the corner. So let's make everything ready for his arrival. Let's get rid of all the dissidents. Let's get rid of all the people that didn't want to take the mark of the beast. Let's get rid of them and everything's going to be happy. And for three and a half years, they live in what they perceive to be a utopia. The beast is the politician. The beast is the king. What's it say that he does? Well, first they worship the dragon. The only thing keeping this world, well, the people in this world right now, from worshiping Satan in totality is what? The Holy Ghost. The flesh likes his doctrine. What's that? My right to my claim to myself. Why do they worship this dragon? Why do they worship Satan? Because Satan lets them do whatever they want to because he knows it'll bring about their own destruction, which is what he wants. He'll lie to them to make them happy. Why? So that they fall into another snare or another trap. Just like he does nowadays. But it says they worship him. Why? Because they or he empowered the one that came and set everything right in their eyes. And I got rid of all them closed-minded Christian Bible thumper folks. Right? They won't even remember those that were raptured out. Right? We remember that strong delusion will come upon them to what? They'll believe a lie if they've already heard the gospel. But also, one of those lies is what happened to those people that used to be here. It'll be as if we never existed to them. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? They're going to give praise and worship to the one that empowered the one who made their lives easier. Yeah, all them hippies. Right? That didn't want to fall in line because you're the man, man. Right? What do you think is going to happen to them off the map? What do you think is going to happen to all the people that say, Hey, you can't come down here and take all our stuff. That's why I got me an arsenal all to myself. So if they don't fall in line, they're going to die. Or are they going to have to run and survive and die the death of a martyr? All because what? Because they won't admit that their new God is the best God. 
Now, I don't understand why the world thinks that that would be such a hard thing. Y'all ever heard of things like the Spanish Inquisition? The spirit of Antichrist has been trying to kill people that believe in Christ for years. Decades. Thousands of years. All because what? Because you won't accept what we say God is. But what you say God is is not what we were taught that God is. Some people came along and said, who you say God is is not what this says God is. You know what happened to those people? Well, at one point, they just killed them. Then other people are like, hey, you can't do that. We got the freedom of speech. And sometimes they let them have freedom of speech, and other times they didn't. But you know what they did then? They ridiculed them. They mocked them. They drug their name through the dirt. They discredited them. They made them a laughing stock. They couldn't literally kill them, so they killed their reputation and their testimony. You find it any wonder that once God comes out, you know, leaves the world and says, for seven years it's yours, you find it any wonder that they're going to do worse things than what they've been doing before? No. But all the world unites under this beast. Why? Why do they give them those ten crowns? to reign over the ten kingdoms, if you will, of the world. Why do they accept this thing that was wounded, close to death, but yet recovered? It says, verse number four, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? You know why they follow him? Because they can't stop him. Say what you want. It does make sense to the flesh that if you can't beat them, join them. Who's like under the beast? We've never seen anybody like him before. For once, there was something new under the sun on this day. Because from time past, immemorial, until today, nobody's ever seen the Antichrist. His spirit's been around. The idea of Antichrist has been around, but they've never seen anything like him. And what's more is when he shows up, those that tried to fight against him couldn't do nothing to touch him. Why do they follow him? Because they think, oh, if there's any problems, he'll just solve them. It's easier this way. We don't even have to worry about those things that we used to worry about. He'll take care of all of it. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like the mindset of somebody who's signing themselves up for slavery, for bondage. If you know you can't beat him, you can't resist what he wants you to do. It says, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Great things, what? Wondrous things. Things that man could not conceive of. Promises that... Man's always longed for, but now he's finally got the plan to make it happen. But then it says, and blasphemies. He declares things which go not only directly against this, directly against God. Blasphemies that Christ wasn't Christ, that God doesn't exist. Perhaps he'll spin the story that I got into a fight with God, but I beat him. Right? He wounded me, but I lived. He didn't. He'll say that there is no heaven and there is no hell. He'll say there's only this life, so live it like you want to have fun. If somebody else tries to get in your way, right? if they're trying to be a goody two-shoes, kill them. Just do what you want to do and stop anybody that tries to get in your way. Great things, but blasphemies. Everything that comes out of his mouth will what? Will speak against the very nature of God, the very nature of God's Son, and everything that the Holy Ghost in his office work did on this earth. Well... It says to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, 
and them that dwell in heaven. The very things that he denies, he knows are true. It doesn't say that he believes these blasphemies, it says that he speaks them. You know what the worst kind of deception is? The one where when somebody is telling you something, they know it's wrong, they know it's bad for you, but they want you to believe it for their sake because of what they get out of it. There is a space of grace for somebody who was hoodwinked and then unknowingly hoodwinked you. They didn't know any better. They believed what they were told, right, wrong, or indifferent, but then they tried to share it with you. But that's not what's going on here. These blasphemes that he speaks, it says against God. It says against his tabernacle. The tabernacle in the Old Testament was a temporary home for what? The Ark of the Covenant, for the mercy seat, for the altar, for all the things that God had given unto Israel to worship God and to maintain a relationship with God, to find approval in the eyes of God. Also, we know that the saints are a tabernacle. Why? Because we are indwelled by the Holy Ghost. Sealed with the Holy Ghost. That spirit of promise. So we are his tabernacles. But he's also talking about the tabernacle, the temple in heaven. You remember a couple of chapters ago where God opened up that temple in heaven? And when he opened the door, great, you know, the earth started having itself a party, knowing that God was about ready to come back. The ark of the testimony was inside of it. What's he blaspheming against everything that God ever promised he'd do he said he didn't do it remember when God said that if we lived a riotous and a wicked life that he'd wipe us off the earth well strike me down God knowing that God won't do it at that moment in time that tabernacle he's going to try to demolish erase and blaspheme lie against every evidence that God ever walked among men, had fellowship with men, had a way that man could find out what was right in the eyes of God and then know what to do in order to be right in the eyes of God. You think just because we're gone, he's going to be happy that there's all these different copies of this book laying around the world? No. He's going to seek it out to destroy it to destroy any remnants of things that say worthy is the Lamb or to God be the glory. He's going after the proof that God once had a place among men. Why? Because He wants to fill that spot in the world. So He has to get rid of the evidence that God was ever here. But then it says, and them that dwell in heaven. You think he's trying to deny angels? Oh. He's trying to get rid of that verse in the Bible where God says, and their works do follow them. Who's dwelling in heaven once the great tribulation starts? That'd be all the saints. The angels don't dwell in heaven. They don't live there. God has them there for a, a position. They're working. They don't dwell there. That's where they serve the Lord. You know who dwells in heaven? God the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and those that to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Did Jesus not say, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself? Why is he going to prepare a place for you? So that you can dwell with him. These blasphemes, or blasphemies that he's speaking against those that dwell in heaven. What's he going to say? Well, he's going to get it into the mind of people that all those things which you left by, you don't get to take it with you in the rapture. All those prayer journals that you got, all the times that you witnessed to somebody else, all those times that you went and handed out a track 
What's he doing? He's saying they were deceivers and they were trying to get you to be a part of their cult so that you'd give them money. They call them tithes. What's he doing? He's speaking against the very existence that you left behind. He's blaspheming against what those used to do. Why? Because he's going to say his way is the right way. Now, it ought to be a desire of yours that you yield yourself to the Lord, that He uses you for His will so often and so greatly that the Antichrist is going to have to spend time trying to undo what God let you do. Because according to this verse, He's going to have to. What do you think is going to happen to all them old church buildings that people don't meet in anymore? They're going to tear them down. They're going to have a party while doing it. It's going to be like some of those World War II videos where they were tearing down all of the fascist memorabilia and the people were raising their own flag in its place. What were they doing? They were celebratory. celebratory. Some were weeping. Some were shouting. Some were playing music. Some were dancing. Why? Because they were joyous at the fact that they were getting rid of what was before and replacing it with something better. It'll be no different in these days. But why are they going to be happy to do it? Because they believe the blasphemies of the Antichrist. That everything that you lived your life for was wrong. That's what he's going to tell them. It says it was given unto him, verse number 7, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Who are those saints? The ones that reject the mark of the beast that we've already heard about. Those that won't fall in line with them. That say, no, 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 no. We found this book and what this book says, I remember all them things happening. This makes a whole lot of sense. Everything that you're saying doesn't make too much sense. If you were so powerful, if this dragon of yours was so powerful, why is he just showing up now? They say, we'll believe God. We're not going to believe you. What's he do? He makes war against them. And the people of earth are going to praise him for it. You remember when it says, and who can make war against him? That means who can defeat him? Who can withstand his might? Why? Because he's gone after the saints and destroyed them. Those that we read about, that when the seal was opened up, white robes were given unto them because they died a martyr's death. They're the ones that will be fighting against them, but they don't stand a chance. Why? Because power was given to them to make war. It says, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. All those three things, kindreds, tongues, and nations. However you want to draw lines on that map back there, or however they redraw the lines tomorrow on who owns what and who's in charge and what nation's in charge. When it says that he's in charge of all kindreds, that means all different people, all tongues, not just that they're related, but that they also speak regardless of whatever language. Right? And then it says, and nations. You do understand that the lines on the map were put there by people that live very far away most of the time from where those lines are drawn. They have no idea about the people that are living there. They just want a clean line where they can say, this belongs to somebody, that belongs to somebody else. But all over this world, there are different tribes. There are different communities that they stretch across lines on the map and they don't get along with the people that drew the lines on the map. Why? Because they said you're trying to take part of what has always been ours and you're trying to give it to two different people. There has never at any point since Cain slew Abel that all men on the face of the earth have lived in unity. Ever since Cain was banished, outlawed, kicked out of what God had intended for him, there's always been 
enmity between man and other man. And what this verse, kindred, tongues, and nations, it means that for once, everybody's going to lay down their own flags, their own identities, their own cultures, and what are they going to do? They're going to embrace His. How many times have you heard our pastor say that the world, since Jesus has gone or ascended back up into glory, has never seen one church that was totally sold out for God? Well, now imagine that at this point the whole world is totally sold out to everything that is against God. And their one goal is to erase all memory of God so that they can get on with what they want to do and not be bothered by it, not be judged for it, not be criticized for it. They can live in whatever debauchery they want. They don't worship the Antichrist because they really think that he's all that wonderful. They do it for selfish reasons. Because he's the one that got rid of everybody that used to tell them that they were wrong or they were immoral or indecent or you can't do that around here and what's left anarchy anarchy by definition doesn't mean destruction it just means that you're free to do whatever you want to without consequence then it says and all that dwelt upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world in other words Unless you're saved and raptured out of here. Unless you're one of the 144,000 that we read about in the chapter before this. Or unless you were one of the martyrs that he eventually kills and destroys. For not agreeing with him. Every person that draws breath is going to bow down and worship and give reverence unto the beast. Does that mean that they'll erect temples to him and they'll pray to him? I don't know but I know they're going to give them a whole lot of credit. They're going to sing praises unto them. They're going to have parades, right? Great feast in his honor because of all of his accomplishments. Why? Because he's the one that tells them it's okay to be the way that you were born, sinful. He tells them we're going to take away all the restrictions against the things that you desire to do. And why do they worship him? Because one person finally put a plan together where everybody can be however they want to be and everybody else is just okay with it. That's a foreign concept to us. But it's real easy to turn the hearts of people in one direction when they have what? A common enemy. He's going to say, these people are the root of all of your problem. If we get rid of them, if we can finally wipe them out, then everything's going to be great. And for three and a half years, everything that he says does come true. It will be a frightening time. We can't even wrap our heads around the things that they're going to come up with. Why? Because they'll be left to their own devices without the Spirit of God walking, among, walking on the face of the earth. But it doesn't matter how quick somebody is or they try to outmaneuver him. He's got the body like a leopard. He's more agile. Doesn't matter who tries to punch him. He's going to punch back. And with those feet like a bear, he's going to do more damage. They say, well, we got six fellas over here that we've been thinking real hard. And he's like, hey, I got seven heads. I'm smarter. He's got ten horns. What are those horns for? To hang ten crowns off of. He's going to have all power. Well, we'd like to do this. No. And nobody's going to be able to stop him. There's not going to be an assembly vote where they can, well, if we vote this, then he has to do it. Nope. It's his way or the grave. But you know what his way is going to be? You just be you and don't worry about anybody else. We can all get along. 
here's my plan and as long as we follow this plan everything's going to be great and for three and a half years they're going to buy it hook, line, and sinker how much are they going to buy it that in the second three and a half years they've bought into it so much that all those things that we read about in the chapters before this don't deter them from still following him they worship him why? because they believe in him they trust him they've given themselves over body, soul, and mind to him and they're so committed that even when God brings about all the things that we have read and we're getting ready to read they're still not deterred by it why? because he gave us a better life right? until things went bad he had all the answers and he says that the one that gave him power is coming and he'll set everything right it'll be okay he is a master manipulator and deceiver just like the one that gave him power once he gets his teeth into you just like the sorry no good devil he doesn't want to let go he wants to keep you ensnared and trapped why do you think that he makes them take the mark of the beast either into their right hand or their forehead because he says in order to be one of mine you got to give part of yourself to me is that not the very definition of antichrist Christ took nothing from you but gave himself to you yet the antichrist desires you to give him something to show your loyalty or your allegiance God gave his son to prove his love to you the Antichrist requires that you conform to him before he'll accept you. He says you've got to look a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, do all of these things. You've got to use my special Kroger discount card, right, in order to make purchases anywhere. I've got to know where you're at, what you're doing everything about you at all times you've got to take this that used to be your free will and give it to me he says and then everything will be good just follow me it'll all work out then verse 9 says if any man have an ear let him hear you know why John cries out the warning if any man has an ear let him hear not only is it go back to chapter 2 and chapter number 3 if any man have an ear let him hear what the Spirit say to the seven churches he's not only reiterating that this didn't come from John it came from God He's also saying, really, take a listen. Do you really want your loved ones? People that you don't even know. You'll never meet. Would you want anybody to have to deal with this? It's a warning to those that haven't accepted the Lord as their Savior. You really want to put up with this joker? Even if you realize that he's wrong and you try to fight against him, he's going to kill you. Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's saying, here's a taste of what the Antichrist is. You know what it is? It's bitter. the only problem I have with Chinese food is that you're full one second and then like two seconds later you're hungry again you go from full to empty right people say that soft drinks only make you thirstier because of the salt in them don't care Diet Mountain Dew is good I'm going to keep drinking it but he says the Lord is what? sweet you can savor the things of the Lord enjoy them they are good 
But every bite that you take of him, he's sucking more out of you, not giving unto you. If you have an ear to hear, listen. Take note of it. Tell others about what's coming. Because the name that he was given wasn't the lamb. A lamb can't do nothing to you. As far as injuring you, how did Christ come? He came as a servant. He came to do the will of the Father. He was a lamb that laid down its life. He didn't come as the lion the first time. What did he come as? He came as the lamb. But yet, when this one comes walking out of the ocean, out of the middle of nowhere, where people didn't see him coming from, what's he do? He's a beast from the very get-go. He's about destruction and taking and consuming. Christ came not to do something to you. He came to do something for you. The beast comes to what? Impose his will on you and take from you. All the while giving you the lie that lies better than it ever has been and you buy into it so much that you start believing it. Say, how's that happen? Well, I've looked into that a whole bunch. Part of it's mob mentality. If everybody says it, it must be true. Part of it also is going to be the fact that people just don't want to feel left out. They don't want to feel othered. I want to be a part of the cool crowd. But all throughout history, the great atrocities that man's committed against other men, you know what enabled them to do it? Because somebody told them to do it that was higher up the chain. All the world needs is somebody telling them it's okay to do what it is that you want to do, and that's all it's going to take for the wheels to fall off of this thing. So if you have ears, hear. But then go and tell. Get a burden for those and say, Lord, we don't want to leave those behind. We're taking as many as we can with us. Why? Because... Once they take the mark of the beast, what are they? They're damned to the lake of fire. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.